Welcome to the Joe Watt Podcast. I am Joe Vendramini from the University of Florida Range Cattle Research and Education Center. And today our guest is Dr. Luis Prada Silva, the University of Queensland in Australia. Luis, thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for inviting me. And, and Luis, can you please tell us uh, a little bit about your background? Yeah, well, I, as, as you can probably tell, I'm from Brazil. Uh, uh, I've been here in Queens at the University of Queensland for the last three years, a little bit more than three years, working as a senior researcher at the University of Queensland. Before that, I was uh, teaching at the vet school at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil for 14 years. Uh, so I come from agricultural background. I went to, to the best egg school in Brazil and I did a master's also in Brazil and a PhD a uh, little closer to you at, at Michigan State, working with dairy cattle nutrition. And uh, after working with dairy cattle nutrition, I decided I, I didn't want to lose money anymore, so I changed to beef cattle. And I've been, I've been working with beef cattle nutrition since then. And, and Luis, uh, can you please tell us um, like a big picture of the cow-calf operations in the region? Australia is a big country, so we'll not try to cover all bases, but just a description of the cow-calf system at, at the state of Queensland. I assume that Queensland has the greatest herd, right? In, in yes. Australia. So it does. That, that would be a good representation. Yeah. Yes. So Australia has about 26 million heads of cattle, Joe, and, and half of that are in Queensland. And, and the, the majority of the cow-calf operations, what we call here the breeder herd, would also be in, in Queensland. Uh, so to talk about Queensland, we, you know, we need to talk about the weather. You know, the, it's a very dry region of the world, but that's not the major problem. Uh, the major problem is that the climate is, is highly variable. It's the, it's, the, it's the country in the world with the highest variability in climate. Uh, what that means to me after three years I've been here is that it probably goes from dry to drier because it's always, it's always on the dry season around here. There's always a drought. But anyway, in Queensland, uh, close to where I am, the south of the states where you see most of the people have a, a big cities and also the agriculture is here. So that's where you see the feedlot area. You know, most of the lot feeders are in the south of the state. Uh, the central part of the state, you have better grasses, better soil fertility and more moisture. So that's where you see the, the more in intensive production with uh, some finishing operation uh, on pasture. But then you go to the north and to the west of the state and you're talking about areas with uh, 300, 200 millimeters of rain per year. And that's where you see the, the cow-calf operation. And so because of the weather, it's, it's really, uh, the animals are eating a very low quality forage most of the time. Very, very, with very low levels of protein. Uh, so the majority of the herd are, are Brahma cows. A lot of Pozindicus blood on the, on the cow herd in Queensland. And uh, some of the major problems we have, Joe, because of this, this poor nutrition is high level of ca uh, cow mortality. You know, about 10% of the cows we actually die every year just because not enough uh, nutrients. And also a uh, high level of calf mortality. Uh, again, the average for the state is somewhere between 10 to 15% of the calves uh, dying every year uh, because of uh, low nutrition. And, and Luis, I, I assume that with the mortality, probably you have some pregnancy rates that are also quite low. And, and that is a relative term, but uh, do you have any numbers about how do would be the, the pregnancy rates that you know, on average? Yeah, so uh, there was a big project a few years ago 
doing a, a getting all these big numbers from the CalCap operations here in Queensland and the Northern Territory. This was called the cash cow project. Uh, and when you look at only the fertility rate, it was actually not bad. It was around 70%, 74% on average for, for the state. Uh, really the, the calf mortality and the cow mortality uh, were, were more of the problems. But you need to realize that most farmers here don't do controlled mating. So the bulls remain with the cows throughout the whole year. So it's not as if we have like 45 days or 60 or 90 days of mating, mating season. It's actually spread throughout the year. Yeah. Very low, very low use of uh, artificial inseminations. It's mostly mm -hmm. made natural mating. Yeah, and, and that make it really difficult, right? Even to find out what is the pregnancy rate because when, when you're gonna check, right? If you, the bull is here along with the cow, it, it, it limits your ability to have good numbers, right? Yeah, that's another issue is that because, you know, an average farm uh, here in Queensland will have uh, 40,000 hectares. And usually the fam would own uh, more than one property so you can move ghetto around. So we're talking about massive areas of land uh, with very little ability to manage the herd. So the farmers would bring the cows, bring the herd to the yards only once a year or twice a year, not more than that. Uh, so we need to go out with helicopters to bring the, the, the animals. And it makes it hard, as you said, makes it really hard to have good numbers of what's happening. So when you say like a fertility rate is you measure last year when you brought the animals in August uh, and then you bring again next year and, and you see who is pregnant, who is not pregnant. Mm -hmm. and, and Luis, you mentioned uh, about the, the Brahman influence in the herd that has, uh, if you have to select like a, a, a average cow, for Queensland, do you think it will be a cross between an English breed and a Brahman, or it will be like a purebred Brahman cow? Yeah, there's a lot of crossing happening. Uh, mm -hmm. Not not necessarily with British breeds, although Angus is is growing. The use of Angus uh, genetics is growing here, but it's not going to the north. Uh, but you you see a lot of mixture uh, with uh, with other breeds like Shorthorn or or uh, Santa Gertrudis or Mm -hmm. South Masters is a breed that is, is popular here. So you do see a lot of uh, mixing, mm -hmm. but a heavy a uh, Indicus influence on the Northern herd. Okay. And, and Luis, uh, going back to the nutrition standpoint, because that's your area and, and you have been working with this um, efficiency of uh, protein supplementation and nutrient cycling in the cow and how the cow is absorbing and using that. Can, can you please tell us a little bit about your findings and your work with protein supplementation? Yeah, sure can. Uh, so when we have a situation like the one I'm describing, Joe, and, and these animals, they, they come to the water or to the supplement just once a day, and then they need to walk you know, one or two or more kilometers to harvest the, the grass and they just come back on the next day for water and supplements. So, you know, if you are supplementing with urea, uh, the animal is only getting this supplement once a day at most. It's probably more like once every three or four days. Mm -hmm. uh, and the level of protein on the diet is really low. So it makes sense that an, an animal to survive here and to be uh, productive needs to have a pretty good uh, mechanism to not lose the nitrogen, you know, to preserve the nitrogen in the body. When you, when you are in a situation that you're feeding a lot of nitrogen to the animals, then this physiological mechanism is probably not important. And the problem I, I saw here is that uh, people wanted to start selecting for feed efficiency. But a traditional way to select an animal for feed efficiency, as you know uh, really well, is to put these animals on a feedlot with a lot of uh, good quality uh, forage and, and protein supplements in front of them so they can express the maximum genetic potential for average daily gain. 
So in that situation, the ability of the animal to preserve nitrogen is probably irrelevant for the performance. Probably you have excess nitrogen in the diet. Uh, so that's probably not the smartest way to select the animals for feed efficiency if you're going to improve the performance of the animals here in Queensland. So we did this experiment to, to test exactly that hypothesis. And we saw that when you feed the animals with, a, let's call that a challenging diet with low protein content, the animals that, that have better feed efficiency actually the animals that are losing less nitrogen on the urine the feces, so they're able to maintain the nitrogen inside the body. Uh, when you feed the animals with a normal diet, with an, enough protein, then that relationship disappears. The more efficient animals on the good diets are not the animals that are good at preserving nitrogen. It might actually be the reverse, but uh, uh, so that's, that's important for us because uh, we can select for efficiency, which is, is important for the survival and the performance of cows in this environment. But we need to select these animals for a diet that actually makes sense, for diets that are low in protein. So you can select for animals that are good at preserving nitrogen. Now, that also... Uh, because of the relationship between the nitrogen and the feed efficiency, that opens some possibilities for actually detecting these more efficient animals at the farm itself, uh, not having to do a, a feed trial to detect these animals. So that's another part of the project we're doing, Joe, is, is trying to come up with a more practical tools to detect these efficient animals at the farm level. And uh, uh, have you have you tried or or are you testing some of these tools right now? Then do you have any any information about if there are some indicators? I have another question regarding yeah. heritability of that trait. But um, so uh, how how is that that working on on trying to identify those animals? Yeah. So we are uh, we are running a couple of projects looking at that. And we are seeing that it is possible to, to uh, identify more efficient animals based on the nitrogen signature of the animal just by uh, collecting a sample of the tail hair. I see. Uh, yeah. So it's possible. And, and we have data on, on steers and also on, on cows. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing that, the, for example, the cows that get pregnant every year mm -hmm. are probably the cows also that are good at preserving nitrogen mm -hmm. in this environment, in the northern environment that I'm talking about. So yeah, that's, that's the kind of uh, tool that we're, we are trying to develop here. And we see that being useful, uh, not only for selecting animals for feed efficiency, but another important one is how well an animal uh, responds to a urea supplement. You know, when you are a situation like the one I'm describing, where the animal only leaks a little bit of urea once a day or every three days, you know, the ability of the animal to respond to this urea is, is also linked to the, to the nitrogen recycling uh, mm. that is happening inside the animal. Yeah, that, that is very interesting. And Luis, do you have any information about the herdability, if, if that will will go with the offspring or through generations and yeah so we, we only have the data from the traditional studies with feed efficiency mm -hmm. on, on very good diets and then the herd ability there is are decent mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's able you know you are able to improve the feed efficiency of the herd uh, selecting for residual feed intake and that has mm -hmm. been done several times now, there has not been a long-term uh, selection when you are actually selecting for nitrogen efficiency or for the ability of the animals to perform on a low-protein diet. So we don't know the heritability on that situation, but you, know, you can assume it will be similar. Uh -huh. And did, did, you have, did you test some different uh, breeds or different phenotypes, genotypes, something? Uh, correlated or or you are 
testing consistently one type of animal? Yeah, we are using uh, just Brahmas right now. Okay. Uh, we're actually uh, planning, if we find the fundings, mm -hmm. to compare the Brahma with other breeds. But it's, no, we, haven't, we have not done that yet. Okay. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a good assumption that the Bos Indicus cattle that are, have been living on the stuff environments for longer, that mm -hmm. they naturally develop the ability to preserve nitrogen. And animals that have developed in regions with better uh, forage quality, they did not necessarily develop, develop the same ability. Yes, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, j just the last question, that is very interesting. And uh, do you, did you see any relationship between like a frame, the body frame of the animal, like uh, taller animals or shorter animals or related to the height and, and the, the frame, if there is any relationship there? Yeah, uh, no, we, we don't have the numbers to look at that, Joe, but what we did look was uh, temperament. Uh-huh. Uh, so when, when you have these animals that never seen humans before and you bring them to the research station, that's very really interesting, right? I mean, some uh -huh. of them are, we cannot keep them here. They jump like three meters high fence and they disappear because they're just so scared that they cannot. So we start measuring the temperament. Uh, and the way we did that is what we call the flight zone. So you approach the animal and some animals when you are 10 meters away from them, they start to run away from you. So a very mm -hmm. long flight zone. And other animals you can approach and touch and it doesn't bother you. So we start to measure in that. And actually we did see a, a, a correlation between the temperament of the animal and the feed efficiency of the animal. So it's, that's something that, uh, yeah, we are, we are interested. And, and frame will change that as well, the relationship because an animal that is gaining more muscle or more fat or bone, that will all change the feed efficiency. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that is, that is it's quite interesting. And, and on those diets, Luis, that you yeah. keep those animals with, uh, let's say, a limited supply of protein or something that will be below what we believe is the requirement. So uh, are you supplying the energy? Uh, the sufficient and there will be at maintenance or, or you are also limiting other nutrients on those animals? Yeah, no, we are, we are, on, we are only limiting the, the amount of nitrogen in the rumen. So okay. the RDP, the rumen degradable protein. So this okay. animal, let's say we formulate the diet to maintain one kilogram of body weight gain per day. Mm -hmm. So there is enough energy on the diet for that, but they are lacking in rumen degradable protein. Okay. So, and, and it's, it's an interesting point that when you say feed efficiency, it, it sounds like a homogeneous term, but it's not. It depends a lot on the type of diet that you are using. If the animal is at maintenance, if it's a low quality forage with low, no energy, or it has some energy, that will change the way you measure feed efficiency. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and that, that has been said, uh, I think there is a, a really high correlation and we talk about that in, in some time ago at the crop science meeting that we, we have done exactly the same thing with plants, right? We, we get those plants and we dump nitrogen in the plant. You have a germplasm that will have 500 plants. And then mm -hmm. you dump nitrogen on those plants, and then you select the three best. And when we take those and, and bring it to a producer to use, he will not fertilize, right? So <laughs> it, it's a disconnection with uh, the, our selection process. And, and the same thing is happening with animals, right? That's right. And it's interesting that when you look at the location of the stud cattle breeders, you know, the people they are selecting for genetics, because they need to have good frame and, and very good body condition, those farms are usually located on the best place in the country, right? When you have most of uh, the highest rainfall and mm -hmm. the best uh, quality of the forages. So we actually, usually we select the bulls on these very good environments, but then we put this genetic on the tough environment. As you said, you know, the farmers are not fertilizing. 
mm -hmm. or they don't have the same quality of forage. So, you know, it's, it's not logical to expect the genetic performance will be the same. Yeah. Luis, we are going towards the end of our conversation here. So um, when you are not working in Queensland, what, what, what is your hobby? What do you like to do on your spare time? If you have some. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Joe, my, my favorite uh, hobby is just pestering my kids, you know, bothering them a lot. We have, <laughs> I have two teenagers at home, uh -huh. uh, 16 and 17. And I, I really enjoy uh, bothering them and make fun of them. But uh -huh. during isolation, actually, you know, I spend so much time at home that I actually bought uh, one of those drum, electric drum kits. Uh -huh. So now I'm trying to learn how to play the drums, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Probably your neighbors are not happy. <laughs> oh, that's why I bought an electronic one. So I can just myself can hear what's, what's happening. <laughs> that's good. So, uh, Luis, I'd like to thank you very much for your participation in the podcast today. And I am Joe Vendramini. Joe what?